Genesis 2, 1 through 19. I need to read uh, these verses so that we all have clarity and there's, there's continuity. From the New King James Version. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he, that is the sovereign God, rested. The Hebrew word there, Shabbat. God ceased in his creative ability. He ceased in the completion of the work of creation. It does not mean that God is no longer creative. He is the creator. But as it pertains to establishing the heavens and the earth and the creation of all that he would entrust to mankind, God ceased in his work of creation. On the seventh day from all of his work, which he had done. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all of his work, which God had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day, in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any of, any of, any plant, this is what happens when you have to wear glasses, maybe I need contacts. I don't know if they'll be better. Verse five, before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Verse seven, and the Lord God formed man, understand the species of mankind, homo sapiens, the human race, the Lord God formed man of the dust. The Hebrew word dust there, afar, it is soil. It is dark mud. It's earth, ashes. Dust of the ground. This is how God formed the, the earth suit, this container of clay. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man, Adam, mankind, the species of mankind became a living nefesh a living being, a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, or it surrounds the whole land, Africa, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. The Delian and the Onyx Stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon, that is Nile, the African Nile. You all understand this, and, and this is in the scripture, that's why I ask you all to follow me in the scripture. I'm not reading something that, that many are not already knowledgeable of, they just will not teach it. And it is evident, it is clear that when God started creation, when God began creation, he created from the continent of Africa. And the gold of that land is good, the Delian and the onyx stone are there. <laughs> the name of the second river is Gihon, it's the African Nile. I know you all will not find this very humorous, but because of statements that have been made, um, and I'll get in trouble for saying this, but uh, Donald Trump is just as black as I am. You missed it. It's when God started. He started with people of color. He started with a black man on the continent of Africa, and it's in the book, it's in the Bible. Y'all might need to tell him where he came from. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. You masters in history and geography, uh, Cush is Ethiopia, and Ethiopia is clearly in Africa. Look at the book. You don't even have to look at my pretty face. 
and look at the Bible. Let me tell you people something, that this is serious. And there will be no segregation in heaven. And in the kingdom of God, there ain't no white church, it ain't no black church, no Latino church, no Asian church. In the kingdom of God, there is the ecclesia, the community of believers, the called out ones, the whole company of the redeemed. That's the church. The name of the third river is Hadikel, Tigris. You can look at the book, look at the Bible. It is the one which goes, or goes toward the east of Assyria. The, the fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man. This is the black man, the man of color, and put him in the Garden of Eden, and he gave him instructions. In the original King James Version, it is to dress and to keep. In the New King James Version, it says to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. God is our provider. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. God keeps his word. Man experienced spiritual death immediately when he transgressed against the will of God. And God says now, it's not good, it's not beneficial to the fulfillment of the man's purpose that he should be alone. Once again, Adam was alone without help, support, without one likened unto himself to contribute to the purpose for which God created him. He was not a lonely man, he was alone. So God says, I will make him a helper comparable to him. But before making the helper, the Bible gives him an assignment. Verse 19, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl, every bird of the air, that's the fowl, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Very powerful statement here because whatever a man calls it, that's what it is. God gave him the ability to name, to identify and whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. This is lesson number four in a series entitled, Black Man Take a Knee. Now, for clarity, we must understand that the Bible truly is its own commentary. It will interpret itself. Scripture interprets scripture. God is very clear in the scripture, the written word. It is amazing to me that, that many of us run off and we ask God, give me a word or give me revelation when we will not obey or honor the written word that is already before us. Why should God tell us anything else other than what he has already made known to us in the Biblia, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? The Bible is the inerrant word of God. It's living. It contains no error. It must be correctly interpreted, however. It contains everything necessary for our salvation. It contains everything necessary for the renewal of the mind. The Bible contains everything necessary to empower us to live the Christian life. The Old Testament is our schoolmaster. It is the embodiment of the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, and from Genesis all the way to Revelation, God is very clear on people of color, and they're all throughout the Bible. Now, you may have seen Bibles with pictures, and you may have seen pictures on the wall, and when you look at your pictures or look at Bibles, you may perhaps see only Caucasian folk with blonde hair, brunette hair, blue eyes, and all of that is a depiction out of the, the mind of a man, but it is not truth. Because from kings, queens, disciples, leaders, bishops, black folk, all the way through scripture, in the Bible, they're right there. I expected you to be quiet. This series is extracted from our 2021 focus. It deals with the importance of, of men knowing, please pay attention, everybody, men knowing who they are and the power entrusted to every man who kneels before a sovereign God in prayer that is passionately and consistently. A man, 
make a distinction here because I recognize that all males are not men. But this series deals with the importance of men knowing who they are and the power entrusted to a man who kneels before a sovereign God in prayer passionately and consistently. The purpose of the series is to expose the lie and teach the truth concerning the black male seed. Every human being came out of the loins of the black man, Adam. That's not racist, that's truth. Every human being came out of the loins of the black man, the man of color, Adam. How do you know he was a man of color? Because God said that from the dust, the afar, the mud, the ashes, the dark soil, God created the human body, the earth suit, the outer exterior, certainly coming from Ethiopia, it's dark. So every human being came out of the loins of a black man. Do you prove that from scripture? We've done the analogies. We've tried to um, put examples before you. And the Bible is clear that in Adam, all died. All experienced spiritual death, separation from God in Adam when he sinned. Prayerfully, we'll have time to get to the scripture in just a minute. God created the human race. I pray we never forget it. I pray we teach our children. God did not create all these races. He created one race. Man stereotyped and labeled people based upon the, the color of the skin, but God created one race, the human race. And God did that from one blood, and there's only one kind of flesh as it pertains to man, and that is humanity. So God, throughout the, the biblical narrative, tells the man who he is, where he came from, and why he is here. God made it very clear in Genesis, man, you are to represent me, represent your creator in the earth. In other words, make sure that you put me on display. You are the imago Dei, that is Latin for image of God. You are the standard bearer. To Salim, the image in the Hebrew, you are my image in the earth. Now understand this, Satan comes after every person, every human being on planet earth because he comes after the image of God. Any person living in planet earth has the capacity to become a born again son or daughter of God. As long as he's breathing, salvation is possible for any human being. Are y'all still here? Satan wants to destroy the image of God. Satan is no match for God. And I'm repeating deliberately because teaching is repeating until learning takes place and repetition is the mother of learning. Satan is no match for God, people. He cannot beat up on God. He cannot take God down. He cannot overtake God. That's why he and those Angels that conspired with him against God were kicked out of heaven and hell was created for the devil and his demons, not for mankind. But mankind can surely go to hell if he chooses to reject Jesus the Christ. It's good teaching. It's not entertaining. It's not supposed to be. And church is not a place that should be used for entertainment or amusement. Church is a place where in we should be making disciples. We should be making sure that there are new converts and that we are spreading the rule and the reign and the reach of God in the earth realm. Church is a place where you need to be educated. You ought to know something. That's why God left us the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So he's no match for God. The devil's no match for God, but he certainly can take you down. He can take me down. If we're not hooked up to God, connected to God, empowered by God, he can and he will take us down. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. He's no match for God. He's coming after God's image, and you're the image of God in the earth. Everything that's happening in our lives adversely is not just mere chance. We must be able to recognize satanic assault. So God created the man 
to represent him, represent our creator, to fellowship and to commune. This is, boy, it's a damnable thing when a man will not commune with his creator, when he will not spend time in prayer. Black man, take a knee. All of us are black folk. All of us came from the man of color, and all of us should spend time on our knees. And it is a damnable thing when a man will not fellowship with his creator, when he will not commune with his creator. He does not know where he's going, and he will not be successful no matter how much money he has, no matter how many women he has on his arms. No matter what he drives, he will not be a successful man independent of God. He was created to fellowship and commune with God, and then he was created to oversee the works of God's hands. He was created to be a steward. This teaching expo exposes the heart of God towards the male seed. And thereby, the family. If I address the heart of God, the male seed, I am addressing the family, the community, the church, and the nation, because it has to start with the male. God has, this needs to be repeated, God has a consistent, unchanging nature, and it's seen throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I want to know the ways of God. Unlike the nation of Israel, the Bible says that they knew the acts of God, but Moses knew the ways of God. He has a consistent, unchanging nature. He wants us to know his ways, and he will never be or behave inconsistent with himself. That's why the Bible says that he is immutable. He's the Lord. He changes not. Our world is in trouble, and certainly the system is corrupt. The world is dark and it's getting darker. And the days are evil. And the church has work to do and we cannot do the work that God put us here to do in the face of racism. Racism is evil. Racism is sin. Racism is a matter of the heart. It is satanically engineered and orchestrated. It breeds division. The body of Christ cannot be a divided body and be an effective body. If we're going to be effective doing what God put us here to do, we must be united. And we cannot be a respecter of persons or skin color. It bears repeating. God created the human race, and within the human race, the original color of the skin was dark. Now, I'll go back to it, because where did all of us black folk come from when you cannot take two white people and produce a black baby because we've learned that it is not genetically possible to do it. And scientists are more abreast of the truth than many churches. Well, you're going to scare all my friends away. You don't have no friend if they can't hear this because we have to have ears to hear the truth. You all understand that in our nation today, there are more interracial marriages than ever before. And it's going to keep escalating. And the dominant gene will always be the black gene. Our key statement, you've heard it before, it bears repeating. To know one's creator is to know oneself. This is where we're messing up. We don't know God. You can quote scripture and not know God, people. You can attend any religious establishment and not know God. You can be disciplined to pray to Buddha or Muhammad, or whoever you want to pray to. Listen, not knowing God. And we're filling up our buildings with people who do not know God. To know one's creator is to know oneself. I know who I am because I know God. I know my creator. And to know his expectations of me, not the world's expectations, not the culture's expectations, but I know God's expectations of me, and I remain in step with his expectations of me. The church must be responsible. The church must address the racism and the color prejudice in the church if we ever expect unity in the household of faith. The body of Christ has work to do. Believe it or not, you all, we haven't been doing the work of the ministry. We're trying to accumulate followers and fans and notoriety and build a platform and a stage for ourselves, but we have not been doing the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is to seek and to save the lost, to baptize young converts, to teach them the word of God, to disciple them, 
to make sure that people, lost men and women, boys and girls, know about Jesus Christ. It is not important that they know me. It is important that they know Christ. So the church has a responsibility. When a people were enslaved, y'all pay attention, not only did we lose our national and cultural identities, but also all we had accumulated, all that we amassed was stripped from us as well. The family unit itself was frequently disintegrated. Preteens and teenagers were often separated from parents and then auctioned while their grieving parents watched. Wives were abducted from their husbands and frequently subjected to sexual abuse from their white masters. In general, the black male was reduced to a position in American society equal to and sometimes less than livestock. Now, to set the record straight, we are no man's property. Amen. We belong to God. And that, that's, a good, that's a good place to give God praise because we belong to him. He does call the shots. So the Tulsa Massacre. Some of you have read the book, Black Wall Street. It proves the brilliance, the brilliance of and the pride of the black man and his family. Don't tell me that we cannot think, we cannot create, we cannot learn, we cannot amass wealth, accumulate wealth. And so I would say to us that we don't stop just because we experienced that Tulsa massacre. I say we need to do it again. Amen. I was talking to some people um, outside of the local church and I say, why stop? We've got the brilliance to do it again. We have the brilliant steel to, to build our, our own businesses, right? Establish financial institutions, educational institutions, and to see our young people aspire to be medical professionals and scientists, right? Why y'all quiet? I said we'd do it again. You see, COVID-19 helped you with all the books you've written and all the music you've produced and all the businesses that you've started COVID-19 helped you, you can do it again. You see, we were not created to be beholden to the government for nothing. We were not created to lay up on welfare and just check out food stamps. We were created with such a degree of brilliance and excellence until you can build your own wealthy enterprise. We did it once, you could do it again. You just have to know who you are. You do need to believe in yourself. I'm going to get in trouble because I don't, you see, I, I'm not going to beg the government for nothing. I'm, I'm, we've never taken faith-based initiative money from the government because the government will never, ever be able to come into this building, this house, and tell this pastor what to preach, what not to preach, what to do, and what not to do. I do recognize that we don't need the government to build. We just need God's people to step up and to not be enslaved to a system that does not have your best interest at heart because if you trust the world system, you'll never get ahead. God created you to transcend the world system by being a part of his kingdom. This ain't nothing deep. This is stuff that's in the Bible that we need to be teaching in churches instead of shouting and shaking our booties. Instead of blowing in somebody's face and pushing somebody down and saying you're slain in the spirit. And I, I want to correct of the statement, God does not slay anybody in the spirit. If you pass out, you passed out, but it wasn't because the Holy Ghost knocked you out. Let's just tell the truth. It is time for us to rise up and to do it again, to build our cities and to build our communities, to build our wealth, and we build our families. Boy, I'm going to get in trouble. So our men must be dealt with because we cannot whore around and, and and impregnate women, get babies all over the place and say that we're men. Because a man does not sleep around and, and just pour out his seed in any belly and abandon his seed. Throughout the month of June, we have exposed the truth about God's creation of the human race, particularly the black man, the man of color, that dominant gene in an effort to honor and esteem highly our men. 
We've looked into the original plan of God. This is God's original plan. I didn't get nothing off the internet. And I didn't go to any self-help book. I didn't go to a commentary. All the commentaries, Reverend and I talked about it. I said, it's a shame before God that the commentaries don't even agree with the Bible. We looked into the original plan of God concerning the male seed. God does not, nor has he ever created one person superior to another, nor has he created one person inferior to another. He created the best. He created us in his image and after his likeness. And I understand that the title could set you back a little bit, specifically when I say black man, but every male is included in the series because every male came out of the one man Adam. What else could you be? What I teach is the truth. It's the truth of scripture. It's not taught in school, not taught in church, and sadly not taught in many of our homes. Why are we intimidated? Why are we afraid? Why are we just scared? Or are we just downright ignorant because we don't study? Are we ignorant because we refuse to listen to the Spirit of God? We are speaking of different shades and colors in one race, the human race. Nobody should be, no other uh, shade, skin color, should be ashamed or afraid to come into this place and listen to me teach because number one, I'm a female in gender, definitely a female in gender, need to emphasize that, and I'm black. Shouldn't have a problem with what I'm saying. Just follow me in the scripture. A point of emphasis, if we want to truly see unity in our churches, we cannot harbor division in our hearts. And I don't know about you all, I was sharing this with my son, he's talking about discernment. I said, now, discernment is a gift from God. We can at best look at people and check people out or surmise where they're coming from, but, but to know the core of an individual and to know the motivating spirit behind the thing, only God can reveal that. We look on the outer exterior, but God is looking at the heart, and only God can give us discernment so we know what we're dealing with. Division can be in the heart, even though I act like I like you on the outside. And if we are walking up close enough with God, God will show you who's for you and who's against you. If we want to truly see unity in our churches, we cannot harbor division in our hearts. Listen, we cannot hate people because of the shade or the color of their skin. Now, I want us to understand this. Nobody walking with God can hate another person. And you say that you walk with God, but you hate people or you despise people or you feel you're superior to other folk. I challenge you. I question your integrity when it comes to a relationship with God. Because when I walk with God, you can hate nobody. Proverbs 24, 12, English Standard Version. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? See, there's somebody greater. God knows what we're all about. Does not he who keeps watch over your soul, that's God, know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? God weighs the heart. He weighs the spirit. So he knows what we're all about. God considers the heart, and every man must rise above the superficial and the shallow. And I don't know about you all. Maybe it's just that I'm, I'm old. Maybe it's just that I've lived over half of my life. I don't let people play with me. This is not a time for us to be playing church or playing games or being foolish or, or playing head games. I don't go to church for anybody to play around with my mind. You see, it's a brilliant thing God created. He gave it to me, and it is designed for me to think to pay attention so you won't play with my mind. You got something to tell me? I'll listen to what you have to say, but don't play with me. Anybody else like that? I ain't got time for you to play with me. I'm too old for that. So God considers the heart, and every man has to rise above the superficial and the shallow. Now, this takes growth, and it is our responsibility to to make this decision, this choice, that I am going to grow and I'm going to rise above the superficial and the shallow. Every man must make it his chief aim in life to know his creator. Must know. So every male should be honored and proud to be a man. 
Got to say it. I don't, listen, all this, 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 I call it mess because it's mess. It's sin. This gay pride month. This ain't no gay pride month. You can call it what it is. You, you may be flaunting sin. But you ain't got nothing to be proud of when you're gay. You all miss what I said. And when a man knows who he is, you don't play around with people who step out and say, I'm gay. You don't play with it. It's a spirit. It's a foul, evil spirit. And you don't play with that. And in our churches, believe it or not, uh, we, we got a whole lot of parading going on. Because just like the issue of the color of our skin, uh, the black man, people of color, we don't want to address that. We don't want to address the reality of homosexuality, lesbianism, all that mess is sin. If it's in the book, we ought to talk about it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah nobody going to like you. You can't grow no church like that. Listen, God's growing the church. And he doesn't compromise when it comes to sin. Every man is a male, but clearly every male is not a man. You all know that. Every male should be honored and proud to be a man. That's what God created. God created Adam a male. He created him a man. And every man is a male, but clearly not every male. Every male is not a man. You have to choose to be a man. You have to choose to be who God created you to be. To be a male is a product of birth. You've, you've heard it. It's in the book, Where Are the Men? But to be a man is a matter of choice. God created the first male, and that first male was a man, the man, Adam. The problems we face today, please listen, people, this stuff is rooted in sin. You can see it if you, if you have any degree of, um, of respect for God, if you, if you have any knowledge of Scripture, to take the rainbow, a symbol of promise from a sovereign God, extend it to the man Noah, saying, listen, Noah, I want you and your wife and your three boys, Shem, Ham, and Japhet, their wives, I want y'all to populate this earth. Now it's in the scripture, they're people of color. Populate this earth. I'm going to give you a rainbow, and the rainbow is to say, I'm, I'm making a covenant with you, a promise with you. I'll never, ever send a flood to destroy the world again. So the devil says, well, you know, I'm a counterfeiter. You know, I'm, you know, I'm the accuser of the brethren. I'm Beelzebub, the prince of demons. So I'll take the rainbow and I'll pervert its use. Instead of a covenant promise that God made with created man, I, I, I'll take it and now you got what you call gay pride and we're going to take the rainbow and that's our symbol. Can you see it? That ain't nothing for us to flaunt or be proud about. But God doesn't take it lightly. You watch. Watch God deal with it. Well, you may just have to let people love who they want to love. I love all people. God loves all people. There's still no room in his kingdom for sin. And I can love you and hate sin. You have to tell people the truth. You can't help people tell them, well, you know, you, you want to love another brother, you can love another brother. You want to love another sister. Love another sister. God loves us all. Sure he does, but ain't no sin going to be in heaven. See, Jesus died to deliver us from that. So the problems we face today is rooted in saying, oh, you're going to get in trouble messing with the people and that rainbow. <laughs> I have lived long enough to recognize this. If God doesn't defend me, I have no defense. If God doesn't vindicate me, I have no vindication. But if God is for me, people, I want you to hear it. Who can be against me? Fear and death in our communities is escalating. And I do not expect the world to heed this message. But the church must. If we want to experience God's divine intervention, God alone can, can bring healing beyond the passing of laws. There's no law that you can pass that's going to heal this land. It's going to take God to do it. God wants unity in his body, not segregation, not racism, not hate. God wants unity. And there must be those who model the life of Christ with this healing power of love. The Bible says it's the only thing that God says does not fail. He says love never fails. Why? Because God is. He is love. And it is out of repentance and a display of love between peoples that there will come, listen people, a great harvest. It's out of the healing power of love. 
There has to be, in the body of Christ, reconciliation. There has to be repentance. There has to be acceptance. There has to be affirmation. Can I repeat some things? I'm going to give you some points, and we're going, we're going to be almost done. There will be no segregation in heaven. Why is there segregation in our churches? There will not be racism, white churches and black churches in the kingdom of God. Why do we have our churches, white church and black church? That's a black church over there, that's a white church. You can, I can go in any church. But why should I be uncomfortable in a church because of the color of my skin? There will be one people, this is from God's perspective, one body, one flock, and one shepherd who unites us all in him. The new thing that God wants to accomplish must begin with those who speak the truth, those who live the truth. Listen, time out, people. It's been out a long time ago for saying one thing in public and living another way behind closed doors. God wants us to proclaim the truth, speak it. He wants us to live it, to model it. God wants us to be truth on display. You understand, people of color, black folk, all throughout the Bible had purpose. You all understand this is not a race issue, right? What kind of issue is it? It's a truth issue. It's not divisive, it's unifying. Truth accepted must become visible. And until it's visible, you didn't accept it. When it comes to identity, I wish I, I knew all, this, all of these rappers you all are listening to. You know, when you walk with God, you know, why, why are you still listening to these rappers? Why are you still listening to that kind of music? Why are you still watching those kind of movies? Why do you run with those kind of people? Why are you? Listen, to minister to a person is separate and distinct from running with folk. We're called out. And we're supposed to be bright enough to blind folk. We ain't blinding nobody. God's word is clear on the identity and the role of the man. Let's start with this. A man is not defined by his sneakers. And I'm telling you, you probably could get out of debt if you stop investing in all those sneakers. You, you might have a nice bank account. A man is not defined by how many women he impregnates. That's not what the penis is for. Oh, I know you're this, 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 is this in the Bible? Is you talking like this? A man is not defined by how many women he impregnates. A man is not defined by how much liquor or dope he consumes. As a matter of truth, a man of God does not consume liquor or use dope. He doesn't sell it. He's not pushing it. He ain't using it. I'm talking about God men now. A man is not defined by the automobile he drives. And we have to stop this. We can't get caught up in the culture. It's all about these sneakers and these women and all this, these drugs and these automobiles, the hype. That's, that's not what God has called us to do. A man does not lap dance with the devil or sleep with other males. Now, y'all know the little song and the little rapper. I know y'all probably don't want to call his name, but y'all don't follow that kind of stuff. You pray for young people like that who need to be born again because surely he's lost. And I guarantee you, there are young people sitting up in here listening to his music. Streaming in, listening to his music. This gets back to parenting. I need to know what my children are listening to. I need to know what my children are watching. A man is not defined by how much money he has. Oh, no, don't mess with that. No, he's not defined by how much money he has. A man is not defined by the filth of mouth, the filth in his mouth. Some of y'all... Ready to turn me off? Y'all ready to leave? Leviticus 18, 22 through 23. Got to deal with all of this. This is all true. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. That's called homosexuality. Yes. Flip it, lesbianism. But it's all in the Bible. Now, why do I need to address this? Because some person was bold enough to say the Bible does not make any statements about homosexuality. Or lesbianism. Well, you haven't read Leviticus 18. You haven't gone to Romans chapter 1. You have not been throughout Genesis when God deals with Saddam and Gomorrah or Ezekiel. So I don't know. We're not being taught if you make statements like the Bible does not address homosexuality. What you want me to say? It's right here. It's in black and white. Can y'all see it? 
You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. I've got men in this church who, who will not even be a part of my illustrations when I try to show you all what the family looks like. It is an abomination for a male to lie with another male. Y'all see it? And you shall not lie with an animal. That's bestiality. And, and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. Now, why would you want to be laying with an animal? Whether it's a horse, a cow, or a dog. That's how far off we are right now. Because there are people, now remember, Leviticus 18, consider our 21st century church. Consider before the first century church in Acts. God talked about this mess in the old dispensation, the Old Testament, when folk were sleeping with animals. And brothers looking at brothers. You need to teach your boys. And girls looking at girls. It ain't okay. So don't push love who you want to love. Listen, I'm embracing Gen Z, Gen X, millennials. You still don't participate in things that God tells us to not participate in. There's no pride in this. Now, I'm going to show you all this. I'm going to have to show you this. I'm going to get to these little bullets. It looks like I'm not going to finish. So I want to show you what a family looks like. Any, anybody, I'm, I'm not going to pick on them. Any husband and wife and a child, you don't mind letting me see, letting me show the world what a family looks like. You, you, you all, uh, Herbert, you all all right? Y'all got a little boy. That's your little nephew, though, right? But still, I can show you what, what I still got to show what the family looks like because I need the men to be clear. I don't have issues in this house. Let me, look, come on, talk, look. Talk to me, let me talk to you. I don't have issues in this house with homosexuality, lesbianism, that kind of stuff. I have to deal with the fornicators and the adulterers. It's all sin and God hates all of that. But I don't deal with that. You know why? Because I address it and folk cannot feel comfortable performing in that stuff in this church. I'm not afraid of the people that I pastor. The people that I pastor did not hire me. God hired me. Listen, and this is so true, and the people that I shepherd cannot fire me, only God fires me. So I'm free to say what God tells me to say when he tells me to say it. And I ain't backing down for nobody. This is what the family looks like. Now, y'all trying to make him come, he don't want to come? That's, that's a good time for you to wake up. You need to hear this. The man, God created to oversee the family. When God said dress and keep, he meant what he said. The Hebrew word, when it comes to uh, dressing and keeping, God says, now you make sure you serve your family. You work to make sure that everything is in order. You oversee, you protect, you guide, you lead. This is what a family looks like. This ain't no transgender nothing. It's a whole woman. A female with a womb that she was born with. Nothing corrected on her anatomy by a surgeon. God created her the way he wanted her created. Boobs and all. There's a purpose for this. Y'all read Proverbs 5. She produces a son. Now they have to be taught right. Otherwise they're going to do what the culture says. This man has a responsibility to be a whole man, a real man. Not on the down low or bisexual going both ways. He should walk tall as a man of statue, a man of standard because he's an image bearer. He's the Imago Dei. He's the image of God in the earth. So his family should see in him God, the image of God. And they should follow suit. Now, they should respect him because he's a man of honor. They should respect him because of the position God put him in. They should respect him because he oversees their well-being. That's what God created a man to do. Uh, I have any brother that I could use as an example. Andre, well, but I miss. I need somebody so I can show y'all this, is, this ain't, this is not Herbert. Ego, so just, all the men saying, don't, don't you try it, Pastor. I can't even use my own husband. Reverend said, don't you ever call me up there. <laughs> but two of this guy, that don't make no family. That's not a marriage. That's perversion. It's satanic. 
and he cannot reproduce after his own kind with another male. But Herbert, let me just get you to stand here. So if Herbert, the only way Satan can carry out his plan to pervert the plan of God, to corrupt the family, the only way Satan can carry out his sick plot, he brings in another male and they will adopt this boy. And now they call this a marriage, they call this a family. It's not. Satan is a counterfeiter. This ain't the real deal here. This is what the devil did. Now, and this is what now we applaud in our society. We applaud it. You know, just let, let them love who they want to love. This ain't love. This is perversion. This is, listen, it is a satanic fantasy. It's not reproducing after God's kind. Thank you all, because I can't get none of the brothers to help me, so I just, that's, so you, we have to address it. The same with two females. If we're going to build a family, I need a father, I need a mother, I need children. Are you all understand? That's how we build strong families. And we start with teaching our men who you are. And if a man won't tell you who you are, thank God he'll raise up a woman to tell you who you are. Let's look at a few points that I think we're going to have to close. I, I really needed to show you all something in Proverbs 23, but you all can read it and maybe we can jump into it next week. A man is a male who, tru who is truly one with his creator. Now, every man in here, a man is a male who truly knows his creator. He's intimate with his creator. So only, the only way you're going to make it in this world, you must know your creator. And if you have a son, you need to teach your son the same. A man is a male who knows he is a steward, never an owner. So Herbert recognizes that he is a steward over Renata. He is a, restore, a steward over Gabe. He's a steward. He doesn't own them. They're not his property. He has no right to beat them to abuse them, to misuse them. I gave you all um, uh, some Hebrew words. I'm going to give that back to you in just a little bit. So he's a steward, never an owner. A man is a male who espouses himself to one wife. So when you get, listen, when you get married, you're committed to that one. Before you get married, you're committed, you're committed to your creator. You're not committed to, look, you're supposed to have no girlfriend like that when y'all doing nothing. You ain't doing that. Espouses himself to one wife, one woman. You get one. We had one guy years ago was taking me and Reverend around in a taxi somewhere. We were on vacation. He said he left Christianity. He went to Islam. He became a Muslim. Now he's got multiple wives. So you left God so you could sin. Because that's all that was about. You wanted to have multiple wives. A man is a male who glorifies God with his spirit. That's the recreated part of me. He glorifies God with his soul, his desires, his appetites, his thoughts. He glorifies God in his mind. If you are committing to memory, 1 Corinthians 13, the Bible says, think no evil. It is possible for you to not think dirty thoughts. And his body. He glorifies God with his body. It is important how you manage, how you exercise stewardship over your physical well-being. Ooh, I'm going to get in trouble. You know, if you're getting ready to get married, the same way you're trying to keep your body in shape, fit, and firm, and fine, that ought to be the duration of the marriage. Amen. You shouldn't say, well, we married now, so she can blow up or he can blow up. She don't want him on her, and he don't want her on him. That's a real deep revelation. Y'all will get that one later. You're too big. There's something wrong with this lady. She just just say it all. A man is a male who is never ruled by the color of one's skin. I will never mistreat another individual because of the color of their skin. That's a man. A man is a male who is not in an identity crisis. <laughs> he don't know who he is or what he is. He is clear on who he is. That's a man. A man is a male who submits to his God-given instructions to dress. That's a bod in the Hebrew. A-B-A-D, it is to work, to serve, to keep, shamar. That is to hedge around that family, guard, protect, attend to, be aware of what's going on in your house. That's what God told Adam. A man is a male who receives corrections and purposes in his heart to change when change is necessary. 
Now you watch these jokers where you can't correct them. Listen, you can't impart, you can't deposit, you can't say nothing to them because they all that. That's a dangerous male. A man is a male who receives corrections and purposes in his heart to change when change is necessary. A man is a male who understands the power of gentleness. A man is a male who bows consistently before Christ, his head. You don't have to bow to nobody else. You don't have to kiss up to nobody, run behind nobody. A male is a man. A man is a male who bows consistently before Christ, his head. A man is a male who receives the truth no matter how difficult. A man is a male who understands the power of fellowship with other men, not just other males. Ooh, y'all missed that. Men can disciple, listen, lead to conversion, minister to these, these young males, but when it comes to fellowship, men need to have fellowship. You brothers, you don't miss your time of fellowship. That's why you have men's ministry, because men need that opportunity to fellowship with other men. You understand there's power in it. Iron sharpens iron. It's fellowship. It's a giving and a receiving. Yeah. But you, you can't be playing around with other males. You need to disciple them, train them, get them to grow up. A man is a male who chooses to be educated, not ignorant. He chooses to be educated. Genesis will educate you if you read it. Let's close with this passage. Boy, I hate I didn't get to Proverbs 23. When I was a child, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Let me go back to it. When I was a child, that's a male. When I was a child, that's a male. When I was a child, that's a male. I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When? I became a man. I gave up childish ways. What are you saying? A male has to choose to be a man. How many of you all have met some, um, some 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 year old jokers and they're still not men, they're still males? Are you all bold enough to let me close with one, one, one other, can I close one? I just need y'all to see it because I gave y'all all these uh, descriptive Bullets concerning a man, but I want you all to see in Proverbs 23, 19 through 35. Let me just let you see it real quickly and we'll stop. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way, that is in the way of God. Be not among wine bibbers. I needed you all to see this because a man is not given over to wine. You don't need anything to alter your mental state. We need sober men. We need men who are grounded in wisdom. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. Can you see it? Oh, I wish he had stopped. And drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. That's the lazy joker. Don't want to get up and do nothing. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee. And despise not thy mother when she is old. Buy the truth and sell it not. Don't try to merchandise or market holy things. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. And he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. I wanted to read it from the King James. You all can read it in another translation. But here, verse 25. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad. And she that bear thee shall rejoice. My son... Give me thine heart, because a man knows his creator. Give me thine heart, and let not, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Be obedient to the word of God. Uh-oh, verse 27. For a whore is a deep ditch. He's a spouse. The man of God is a spouse to one woman, his wife. And a strange woman. See, y'all see how quiet it's real quiet in here while you stream it's real quiet, because people don't like that terminology. I didn't say it, it's in the Bible. For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. Boy, she also lieth in wait as for prey and increaseth. Listen, the transgressors among men, she takes them down. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? 
Who hath wounds without cause? Look at this. Come on, y'all pay attention. Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. All those little fancy drinks. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. When it giveth his color in the cup. When it moveth itself around. All right. See, it, it arouses you. Stimulating. It looks exciting. How many of y'all drink wine? How many of y'all gonna have a 4th of July wine party? At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. God says, this is what wine will do to you. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a, a, a mast. They have stricken me. You're hallucinating now, shalt thou say. And I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. I'm going to go after the same old thing. Isn't that amazing? No wine, no strange women, your creator. Come on, let's thank God for his word today. <laughs> oh, my, my, my. I can't see your faces streaming in. Uh, but these people in the auditorium look quite interesting. Let's tell the truth. We want to be the body of Christ. We want to be the body of Christ. And we want to carry out God's work in the earth. We don't want division. We want unity. I guess I have some, some quirks about me in that I don't want people to come to this church and join this church who are divisive. I don't want people to come to this church and join this church who come with strife. I understand that church is a hospital and people come with issues, but you don't have to come trying to sow discord among the brethren. God hates division. I welcome people with all of their imperfections who have a heart to know the truth and to obey God, to do it his way. We're all flawed. The vernacular of the, the culture is we're all jacked up. So there's something wrong with all of us. That's why we have a perfect savior. But we should not be looking at the imperfections in people, the color of their skin, or their weaknesses. We should look at people as people. And something that God has taught me is you can see every person through the eyes of God, through the heart of God, as long as you stay in the face of God. So no matter how messed up you may be, or no matter how you struggle, no matter the weaknesses or how flawed we all are, we can see each other through the perfect lens of truth, the eyes of God, when we spend time with our Creator. Because God teaches us to pe treat people the way we want to be treated, whether they ever treat us that way or not. Because he is a God of love, and love never fails. That's why he gives us instructions when it comes to our enemies. You pray for your enemies and curse not, and you bless them. And when people misuse you, people misunderstand you or abuse you, you don't take it upon yourself to vindicate yourself. He says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. That's what happens when you spend time with him. And that's why when people are not transformed and when people are not changed, I know you're not spending time with God. Because when you spend time with God, he changes you. You cannot remain the same when you labor in the presence of God. See, perhaps you're hitting and missing. You're there sometimes and then you're not. And you're there sometimes and then you're not. You can't change like that. You have to be passionate and consistent about being in his presence and he will change you. You can't have a service, people, and not invite people into the family of God. There are too many buildings filled with folk who don't know God, who've never been born again. So as you all stand to your feet, I'm gonna ask you all, you're gonna have to put those face coverings uh, back on, but before you put them back on, we're all gonna pray this prayer together because I'm concerned. I'm concerned, I, I, I watched, COVID didn't change people, you all. 
It exposed people. It exposed the ones who were walking with God, close to God, and it exposed the ones who were superficial and shallow, who had no depth of earth, who were not walking with God. Because those are the folk who went back to doing everything they were doing before COVID-19. They went back to the bars, they went back to fornicating and committing adultery, they went back to gambling, they went back to porn and masturbation, they went back. And it was too easy for them to go back. COVID didn't change folk, it exposed people. And I found that people that I thought were born again, I saw a different lifestyle. But you could only have that lifestyle because you had no depth of earth, you were not born again. Because you can't meet God and just go back like that. When you're in love with him, you hold a steady course. So we can't have church and not have a call to Christ. Why? Because our days are numbered. You people who are playing with your lives, you don't know when it's going to be your last day, your last second, your last breath. There are people who died who didn't have COVID-19. You can die not being sick. You think mostly it's the old people. How many of you have been watching the young people leave here? We don't want people to die without Christ, right? That's the greatest tragedy. It's for people to die without Christ. You know, the truth of the matter is, you don't know who's born again. Only God knows that. You don't know who's saved. Only God knows. There are a lot of religious people who are not born again. But Jesus did say you'll know a tree by the fruit that it bears. By their lifestyle, you'll know who belongs to me. Can you feel with compassion the heart of God over the sinner? That's why Jesus died for the sinner. And all of us came here sinners. Do you ever feel that? Do you feel the weight of God? Is that person born again? God, are they saved? God, what can I do to be an instrument in your hand to get them in the kingdom? God, don't let them die in that state. Do you feel that? There's something wrong with our hearts if we don't have a burden to get people in the kingdom. Let it be you. Let God use you. You don't have to have a pulpit, but it's a life. Can you say, dear God? dear God? Come on, those of you streaming and everybody, mean it from your heart. Dear God, dear God I, recognize I recognize I came here, I came here a, sinner, a sinner in need, in need of, a of a Savior. I want to be born again. Born again. Save me, Save Jesus. Jesus. Forgive me, Forgive me. For, every for every sin I've committed, I've committed. Aware, aware and unaware. I want to be born again. Right now, save me. Right now, forgive me. Right now, cleanse me. Teach me how to love myself, to love you, to love people. Teach me how to hunger for your word. Give me a shepherd who will tell me the truth. For the balance of my days, I'm yours. Do with me what you will. Be glorified. I just thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. God, I bless you for this house. And I bless you for a learned people. I bless you for people who have hearts that follow hard after you. I bless you for those who are streaming in, God, just to hear the freshness of your word, to experience the glory of your presence. Thank you that your power is so very real, so very tangible. And we're so grateful, Lord God, that you would call us your children. Thank you for teaching us that there is one race, there's one blood, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There is one God. 
teach us how to be unified, how to be a family, a community. And heal us, O oh God, of the hurts and the disappointments, the pain of the past, heal us. Give us a mind always to treat people, God, the way we want to be treated, whether they ever treat us that way or not. Let us operate from the heart of the good shepherd of the sheep. God, may we, as your imago Dei, as your Salim in the earth realm, as your image in the earth realm, may we allow Christ to be seen in us the hope of glory. And no matter how dark the world, oh God, may we be so bright that many sons and daughters will enter into the family of God. I thank you for those who are streaming in and those who are here in this place. Fan the flame, oh God, set us ablaze. Fill us up all over again, anew with the Holy Ghost and fire. Give us a mind to be on mission, to seek and to save the lost. Give us a mind, oh God, to humble ourselves under your mighty hand, knowing that you will exalt us in due season. And that promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or the south, but you'll judge, you put down one and you'll establish another. You're the God who promotes. Be a hedge of protection around about us, oh God. Redeem our lives from destruction. Keep us from stray bullets, automobile accidents. Keep us, Father, from planes crashing and ships sinking, trains colliding. Keep us, oh God, give stability to our feet and friction to our tires. May we ever be mindful that we're saturated, covered, drenched in the blood of the Lamb. And the safest place for us is in the will of God. We will not die, God, until you finish with us. And you say, well done, good and faithful servants. We praise you, O oh God, that your blessings be upon us. That your face, O oh God, will shine upon us. That you lift up your countenance upon us, God, you give us peace. Holy Ghost, you keep us from falling. Present us faultless before the Father's presence with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, honor, dominion, and power. And now, henceforth, and forevermore, God, bless these, your people, as they go. We're eternally committed to you and we give you the glory in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.